Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. You may regret that in a while, but it sounds okay now. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. I'm sure you didn't have much choice in the matter, but you do have a choice on whether you listen or not, and I hope you listen. I came here today because I need your help. That's why I'm at your school. I'm on a mission, really, to change the conversation and the culture around men and women, to take away the shame and the shadows and the stigma that still exists. Your generation could do it. That's why I'm here. And by the way, I love your generation, and I mean that sincerely. You are the least judgmental generation in the history of the United States. You don't get the credit you deserve, but you will. And that's what it's going to take to change the conversation around men and women. I'm a baby boomer, not that you could have ever guessed that. And in my generation, no one talked about mental illness, no one. It was considered shameful. You just hid it. No one ever brought it up. And so people like me didn't know much or anything about it. That's not the answer, by the way. I know that now. I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm sorry about that, but that's where I grew up. And my dad was a high school science teacher. My mother worked in an office in the neighboring town. My best friend, when I was 10 years old, had run across the street from my house, and his father was a graduate of MIT. In my childhood, in my neighborhood, MIT was Rockstar South. My friend's uncle, his father's brother, never finished high school. He was an inmate, an inpatient, at the Danvers Mental Hospital in Danvers, Massachusetts. Every adult who ever spoke at that place, and every kid, including me, used to call it the nuthouse. We must have thought that was funny. Nobody was ashamed, by the way, to say that. Looking back, all these years later, I think we all should have been ashamed. I think now the people confined or treated at Danvers, and all the people who love those people, but that's what we call it. And often, on Sundays in the summer, my friend's father would pick his brother up at the nut house and bring him to their house across the street. I was 10 years old. I can still see that man in my mind's eye by the garage looking at those flowers. He never looked at me, never gestured to me, never spoke to me, but he seemed pretty scary. He was, after all, in the nut house. And on those warm Sundays, I never had the courage to cross the street to play with my friend. I just didn't. I wanted to stay in the safety of my front yard. That's how I did it. And when he would leave my neighborhood late on those warm Sunday evenings, I felt a sense of relief. Because I knew, even as a kid, that he must somehow be a one-off. That I would never know anyone or see anyone again in my life who had a mental health problem. And I was wrong about that, by the way. Which is one of the reasons I've devoted most of my waking hours for the last 39 months, speaking wherever I'm asked on something I now see clearly, but never previously understood. Some decades after that childhood I described, in a different state, New Hampshire, and in a different community, Manchester, and on a street somewhat different than the one I grew up on. Mental illness crossed that road from my childhood and took up residence in my own house. My wife and I knew nothing about it, we didn't see it, but it was in my house and it was growing. I had two sons, 11 and 13, that took up residence in my 13-year-old son. He didn't know he had a mental health problem. It makes sense when you think about it. How would you know? It's just how you feel, how you respond to the people and the circumstances. But he was suffering. When he graduated from the eighth grade, it was on a Saturday, he awakened that morning and told my wife and I I didn't want to go to his graduation. We said, you have to go to your graduation. 
brings out a judgment in life. That wasn't a lie, by the way. But we wouldn't know that for a long time. He was quite an artist when he was young, and he spent a lot of time in his bedroom at his desk with the door closed, drawing. Today, I would describe it as withdrawing. But I was pretty ignorant about mental illness back then. I'm not ignorant now. I'm not ignorant now. My son started smoking in high school. I didn't know that. That got pretty well hit. He had friends at Trinity High School in Manchester, but not as many as his younger brother, who was two years behind him. If you look at the yearbook for the year he graduated, you'll find his photograph of all the other graduates, but if you look through the yearbook at the cannon shop, at the football games, the dances, you won't see him in the cannon shop because he wasn't at those places. He was probably home drawing or wood drawing. I didn't see it then. I see it now. He did okay in high school, not as well as he could have. I always thought he was smarter than his grades. But he always tested very well, and he got into a pretty good college in New York. And then off he went. And I don't know if it's a true statement or a rumor you guys might know, but I hear sometimes when kids go to college, they drink. Have you heard that? It could be true. I'm not recommending it, I'm just telling you. In my son's case, sadly, it was true. And I could hear his voice on some of those weekend phone calls. It was pretty alarming. I talked to him about it and said, Dad, I don't have a drinking problem. We really don't need to talk about it. Over time, my wife and I would be on campus, and eventually his friends, who did not know us, would seek us out to talk to us about his drinking. To talk to him about it, he said, Dad, I don't know why they say that. I don't drink more than anybody else here. I thought he must have, but I couldn't prove it or disprove it. He looked a lot more disheveled than I remembered him at home. But I just chalked it up to being away at college. That wasn't why, by the way, but we didn't know it then. He did okay in college, again, not as well as he could have, but he tested well. He got into a pretty good graduate school. He got his bachelor's degree. Looking back with what I now know, I mean awe of him. I don't know how he did that. He must have willed himself to that degree. And we got into graduate school in Boston, he came home to live with us. But we lived about 50 miles north of Boston. He commuted three days a week to class. Once he was home, it was obvious he was drinking pretty much every day. It was pretty alarming to watch, but somehow he went to class. He was so tired of talking about his drinking, he moved north of Boston for the last six months of school. He got a master's degree. I don't know how he did that. I don't know how he did that. But well, I didn't understand his problems then. He got a job very quickly, which wasn't surprising. He's really smart. I mean, really smart. Funny. He's a self-taught musician. He's handsome. It's not surprising. But was surprising is the job only lasted for a week. But it wasn't his fault. He said he lost the job. The next job took longer to get last and for less time. And then he moved back with us. He took graphic design classes where he could. He had part-time jobs, hourly rate jobs, things that didn't match his master's degree. And he continued to drink. He tried to hide it, but he really couldn't. And finally, my wife and I reached out to the alcohol experts and we told them what I told all of you here this morning, and they did not hesitate. They said, Judge, your son is an alcoholic. That's what's going on here. And you and your wife are going to have to deal with that. And ultimately, you're going to have two choices. One is to put him out, literally out, and hope that he hits bottom. Remember that expression somewhere in my childhood. Hope he hits bottom and turns his life around. Or you can let him stay in your house and he's going to die drinking there. Not tomorrow, or next week, or even next year, but you can't drink like he's drinking and have a long life. Yeah, we didn't like those choices. We started going to Alabama classes, my wife and I, for family members of alcoholics. 
My son thought that was ridiculous, by the way. He says, Dad, if I didn't have these feelings, I wouldn't be drinking. I tell that that the alcohol people, they would say, Judge, every alcoholic has a reason they drink. He's an alcoholic. We finally persuaded my son he didn't have a drinking problem to go to alcohol rehab. I realize now how silly that was, but at least we didn't have to make that choice, they told us. And then he majored in alcohol rehab. New Hampshire, Connecticut, Cape Cod, and finally he went to Florida. And we were praying that he had some insight about his drinking. After weeks in Florida, I picked him up at Logan Airport in Boston. He told me that he'd been drinking on the plane on the way home. So it obviously hadn't taken him. And then my wife and I had to make that choice they told us about. And my wife's not here today, so I'm not trying to look good in her eyes. Not that I'm opposed to that, but I'm just not doing it right now. So we loved our son and we wanted to do the right thing. It seemed like the only choice that would save his life was to put him out, let him hit bottom, and hopefully turn his life around. And so we made that choice. It was the hardest decision we ever made, and it was the worst decision we ever could have made. But we didn't know that then. Up to that point, no one, no doctor, no teacher, no neighbor, no friend, no family member, and sadly not my wife or I ever said, I wonder if he has a mental health problem. Never came up. My son lived on the streets for three weeks. He slept in his car and ate at the soup kitchen. I was on the state Supreme Court at the time. I would drive from Manchester, where I lived, to Concord every day, where the court was. On the way up, on the way down, I'd be worried about it. Wondered where he was, was he driving, was he drinking? And thinking that we had failed him somehow. My younger son had just up his master's degree, had gotten married, was moving forward. My older son, with all his talent, all his potential was going backwards at 100 miles an hour. He couldn't see it, and we couldn't stop it. And after dreading that phone call, by the way, that no parent ever wants to get, we brought him home. We knew what that meant, but we'd still hope for a miracle. And when he came home, he was drinking just as much as he had been when we put him out. And what I now know, and what I now see but didn't then, it's an underlying mental health problems which he couldn't describe. If I didn't have these feelings then, and which we didn't see, we saw alcohol. Those underlying mental health problems exploded, and he was likely scared to death that would have put him back on the street. He knew he couldn't do that. So he assaulted me. One night he assaulted me. I went to the intensive care unit at the Elliott Hospital in Manchester. I was in the ICU for six or eight days. I have no memory of that, but my wife does. I don't know how she survived that. It was all over the news, she then told me, in New Hampshire, in Massachusetts. They wrote about it in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times. While I was in the ICU, my doctors went on the Today Show, talked about how I was doing, so it wasn't exactly below the radar. But I didn't know any of that then. My master's educated son, decent, funny, <coughs> was arraigned in a public courtroom in Manchester, New Hampshire, issued an injunction and sent to the Valley Street Jail in Manchester. There are a lot of places you might not want to go in your life, but that's one of them. I wasn't really popular at the Valley Street Jail, but that's where my son went, but I didn't know that then. My wife said she'd get so many messages every night she'd just erase them. She said, what would I have told people? What would I have said to them? She visited my son when I was in the ICU. I can't imagine what that was like for her. She said he had his orange jumpsuit on. They talked on the telephone with question lines between them. She said he was very upset. He said, Mom, is Dad okay? Just tell me Dad's going to be okay. He can't believe I did that to Dad. She didn't know in the early days. He said, Mom, they don't know visitors here very often, but on the days you can't come, if you could go to the cemetery, I could see the corner of it from my cell. 
if you went there at certain times and we agreed on them, I could at least see you. And I would know that my family had abandoned me. And so my wife by herself, it was late March, early April, dreary. She would drive to that street corner and park the car and get out and wave at the jail. It was multi storage. She said, I didn't know what floor, what window, or even if she was looking back. And she cried all the way home. I don't know how she survived it. I don't know how she survived it. After six or eight days, I remember being wheeled in a stretcher along a corridor at the hospital. That was the first time I knew I was in the hospital. The fellow was pushing me. I said, what am I doing here? He said, I think you fell. I felt pretty sore for someone had fallen, and I had no other information. And so I had this private room, and after a day and a half, my wife and I were finally alone. I, I couldn't get out of bed, literally two days in that room. And my wife finally told me what had happened as best she knew. And I hadn't fallen. And she told me where my son was. And we both cried. I've been a judge and lawyer my entire professional life. So I knew what it meant for him, for us, for his mother. If I had any understanding at all, it was alcohol when it's abuse can take people to bad places. I don't know the definition, the technical definition of hopelessness, but I know what it feels like. That's what it feels like. I couldn't even stand out of bed. And had I had been able to do it, I couldn't have done anything anyway. But my, when I was released from the hospital, I was there about three weeks. When I was released from the hospital, I wasn't allowed to visit my son. I wouldn't have. The court wouldn't allow it. So I didn't see him for six months. My wife would go twice a week, whatever they allowed. Sometimes friends would go in her place to give her a break. I saw my son after six months. He was being brought to a superior courthouse in Manchester so he could be sentenced to the state prison. I hope you don't have that day in your life. When I was your age, city where you're sitting, I would have said, don't let it happen in my family. It did. He came in that day, my wife and I were in the front row. There was still press, but still a store. He looked great, by the way, he had a drink in six months. And they brought him in, he walked over, I was in the front row of the public section, I stood up and he hugged me and held me back by my shoulders to look at me. He said, Dad, I'm so sorry, I don't know why I did that. I never forget myself, just tell me you're going to be okay. I said, they, they tell me I'm going to be fine. I said, look, I want you to promise me something. He said, what's that? I said, if you don't quit, your mother and I won't quit. He said, I won't quit then. He was then sentenced to seven and a half to 15 years in the state prison. I tell you that now, it still seems surreal to me. My son going to the state prison. In short of six months, or again, seven years to go, court suspended four of the seven. You can serve that on parole, I think, for Logan. But he was definitely going away for three years. I was on the Supreme Court of my state. 20% of my day job was hearing appeals from the very people he would be living with 24-7. I wasn't really popular for state prison. That'll keep you awake at night if your son or daughter is there. After 30 days, you're allowed to have visits. First 30 days, they evaluated every evening. After 30 days, we drove the concrete to a long drive. We met in the secure psychiatric unit of the state prison. They made do good work there with the sterile and antiseptic field. It feels hopeless, is how it feels. And we met in the conference room with the head psychiatrist, two social workers, my son, my wife, and me. And the psychiatrist started the meeting by saying, yeah, I've gotten to know your son over the last 30 days. I really like him. He seems really smart. He's got a great sense of humor. I said, I know that, Dr. Remember, I'm saying, we're in prison here. He said, I know that, Dr. Let me tell you what's going on. Your son has really serious depression. I mean, really serious depression. He has panic and anxiety attacks that are virtually off the charts. And so he started drinking, Judge, because that took care of some of that pain for a while. It wasn't a good decision, 
But you would have done too. If you thought it was you, it wasn't a good call, don't drink your water, but we made a situation worse. He was self-medicating his mental illness, but I didn't know that. And when he said that to us in that place, I thought we had failed him. I was a total parent. I should have known something about mental illness, I didn't. I thought all mental illness was hopeless. That's what I thought. It's far from hopeless. I know that now. After four months, we visit twice a week. He came out one night, hugged us as he always did. He said, Dad, I feel so different. That's what you mean? He said, well, I see a counselor here, Dad, pretty regular. And I take medication. I take it at night. I take it in the morning. I didn't know if you could feel like this, Dad. My palms aren't sweating. My mind is racing. I can focus, Dad. I'm teaching at the prison now. When he told us that, I knew we had failed him. We should have done something. My son was paroled after three years. I said, they won't do that. I was Chief Justice. So it looked like they favored the judge's son. They paroled him. He was so good on parole, he was supposed to be on parole for years. After one year, they eliminated his parole. The parole officer said, why are you on parole? I turned our visit. Something's wrong with this picture. My son was married at the state prison. In the future, anyone making wedding plans here, I, I wouldn't choose the prison. The only advantage is the receptions are pretty inexpensive. Coca-Cola, potato chips. I performed a wedding in a conference room off the main visiting room during visiting hour. The photographer was an inmate with a Polaroid camera. As weird as it must sound to you, as weird as it would have sounded to me if I were sitting where you are, it was the happiest day in the saddest place. My son's wife had her master's degree with him in Boston. She later won an Emmy in New England for her work on film and film editing. I've held the Emmy statue, it's like the one you see on TV. I would keep it, but she won't let me. They have a 10 year old daughter, my granddaughter. I have a grandfather, so I couldn't be objective. But even if I were, she's beautiful. It's a beautiful child. Every time I hug her, I think, you are a miracle child. But I didn't do anything when my son left jail. My son, by the way, who was drinking every day for many years, has not had a drop of alcohol in 15 years. He said, that I'm not that guy anymore. I don't have that tight anymore, Dad. I don't feel like that guy used to feel. It's a good portion, and I love it. And I wouldn't be here, by the way, today or anywhere talking about it if he didn't support it. Every single time, he'll ask me, how did it go today, Dad? So said, I'm really proud of what you're doing. When I first started doing this, I'd say, Dad, there are going to be kids in every gymnasium, every auditorium who have some mental health issue or someone they love or someone they know. I wasn't sure I believed it then, I know it's true now. And there's no shame in any of that. There's zero shame. But I didn't do anything about it for 10 years. Four years ago, I got a call from a psychologist in Concord, New Hampshire. One of me got involved in the campaign that brings me to school today. He told me it was the idea of a psychologist in Maryland. Her name is Martha Van Halen. He asked me to get involved, and I'm the guy from the bubble who never talked about it. So I was shocked when I said yes. We raised a third of a million dollars for the campaign in no time. I used to be dean of the law school at UNH, so I know what raising money feels like. It didn't feel like that. Everyone who gave us money, whether it was a hospital CEO or someone I know on the sidewalk, they all had a mental health store. Somewhere. I realize now most everyone has a mental health toy somewhere. We launched this campaign, nonpartisan, non political awareness campaign, on a Monday morning, May 23rd, 2016, in an empty house chamber in our state house in Compton. 400 theater seats there. The legislature was in session. 
I said, why are we holding this launch here? Who's going to come to this? I just want to let people know we're doing it. And so you may be surprised. 425 people showed up at 10 a.m. The Catholic Bishop, the Episcopal Church, the Jewish community, educators, administrators, law enforcement, judges, families, the Attorney General, every member of our congressional organization, and our then government. Most impressive group I've been in in 40 years in history. I realized that morning that other people were suffering too, or loved people who were suffering. Barbara Van Dalen, the genius behind the five signs, was here that day. She asked the most impressive room I've been in in four decades in that state this question. There's anyone in this chamber this morning, she said, who's been untouched by mental illness, yourself, your family, your friends. If you've been untouched, she said, raise your hand. And I had no idea what to expect, but not one hand went up. Not one meaning every single person had been touched. I said to her afterwards, Barbara, how often does that happen? I said, John, it happens to virtually everyone I go in. Just because people are suffering doesn't mean they're talking about it. There's some shame that that one was John. People wall it off. They don't talk about it. That would have been me. It's not me now. And then she shared these statistics, which I hope will explain to all of you here this morning why I go to schools whenever I'm at. Half of all mental illness in the United States, half, arises by age 14. My son was 13. Two thirds by age 23. Last year in America, more people died by suicide, over 47,000. Fenway Park and then some. Then died in all the car accidents across America. Every 90 minutes, every day, including this day, some brave American veteran, he or she, takes their own life. We lose 20 veterans a day to suicide in America. Now let's not talk about that. It's kind of awkward, uncomfortable. Did you know last year in our country, and for years before last year, more police officers died by suicide than every cause in the line of duty? I didn't know that. Let's not talk about that. Your generation is smarter than I was. That's what I'm here for. I need your help to change it, to talk about it, to fix it, to support those who are suffering, not blaming them for their own suffering. Mental illness is an illness. It's treatable, not a character flaw or a weakness. After our successful launch, we didn't know what to do. So the three of us in the chariot said, well, let's see if anyone asks us to speak anywhere. Over the last 39 months, I've spoken counting this morning 441 times in four states. I've spoken to tens of thousands of school-age kids from sixth grade through senior year. My eyes have been opened like they had never been before. One of the first schools I went to was outside of Concord, New Hampshire, in the gym, very much like this. There were students on both sides. I was under the basketball net at a fixed podium on a six-inch riser with a gooseneck microphone and a 50-foot ceiling. I looked out at the students that morning and I said, they're probably saying, whose grandfather is this guy? And why is he bothering us at school? But I had to speak, I was there. I spoke just as I spoke to all of you today. And when I finished, there was dead silence. I mean, dead silence. I thought, maybe they don't care what I'm saying. Maybe they can't even hear what I'm saying. And then the principal, who was standing against the wall, stepped up on the little rise over there. And then suddenly, after three seconds, students on both sides of that gym stood up and applauded for almost a minute. He said to me, I'm shocked by this. I said, you're shocked. I said, they're not applauding me. They don't know me. Let me tell you about this generation. They're smarter than I was. They agree with what I'm saying. Some of these kids are suffering. Some of them they love or know is suffering. They're tired of it too. That's what their applause means. 
About six weeks later, I was in a large high school in Central New Hampshire in a room just like this. When I finished speaking, kids stood up. The teachers and the counselors were shocked. I'm not shocked anymore. It's not about me. I did that. It is about this. After I spoke, a guy walked out on the June floor. I was standing where I am now. He was a huge guy. I looked like Rod Brown's husband. A baseball cap on backwards and shoulder length hair. My first thought was, I hope I didn't upset this guy. He yelled about two feet from my face. His eyes were wet. He said, Can I ask you a favor? I said, Sure. He said, Can I give you a hug? I said, You're six feet three, sure. He almost broke me in two. He's a big guy. And then he shared with me his own story about my illness, his own journey. Oh my God. I said, then you may be the bravest guy I'm going to meet my whole life, and I returned to Hawk. He said, that would be great. In the last 39 months, I've hugged hundreds and hundreds of kids I will never meet again. In Jensen Auditorium, like this one. Sometimes I just say, thanks for coming, thanks for talking about it. Sometimes I say, I'm ashamed of my now level, so my parents are ashamed of my parents have told me never to talk about it, but my father, and she said the father, by the way, my father doesn't believe in my little as he tells me just to get over it. Those aren't the answers. You know that. What are we waiting for? Why are we not changing the discussion? Too many people have been suffering for too many generations. It makes no sense. It's not morally right. It's not medically right. Silence is not the answer. Let me finish with this. When I go to high school or middle school, it doesn't matter, I say that we can change that if you want. We can change the culture if you want. Or you can do what my generation did and impose the cold silence. Don't talk about it. Blame people for their suffering. But I, I'm thankful for the fact you guys are smarter than that. I told them when I was a kid, my father was a teacher, must have been paid on Thursday nights. We always went to a local little restaurant on Thursday nights. My mother, my sister, myself. Every table in that restaurant had an extra. Some had two. At some point during the evening, everybody in that restaurant was smoking. My father had a master's in chemistry he smoked. I aspired to become a smoker when I was older. We'd get home from the restaurant. Every room in my childhood house, so my bedroom and my sister's, had an ashtray. Every coffee table in America had one. Every public school, every private school, every teacher's room, every hospital lobby, every airplane, every airport, every automobile, they were everywhere. Have you seen an ashtray recently? What happened to it? Something came. When I was a kid, we had a black and white television set. I know what you're thinking, how old is this guy? But that's what we did. We had three channels and rabbit ears on the top. And some nights I'd watch the news with my mother on that black and white television set. I'd see African Americans peacefully marching. I often dressed like I'm dressed this morning. I didn't know why they were marching. Obviously, I do now. Some nights on our broadcast, I'd see them knocked around like bullying pens, hit by fire hoses, attacked by police dogs, hit with Billy Club. Full army to watch at any age when I was a kid. I remember saying to my mother, where's that happening? She wants to cry and said, it's happening in our own country. If you would ask me when that broadcast ended, when I was 12 years old, John, do you think in your lifetime, we will elect somebody with a black face as President of the United States. I was in dry your mind, didn't you just see the news? I'll bet you my ashtray you got to that. Thank you, Barack Hussein Obama. I was Chief Justice when he was campaigning for the presidency of the Hampton. I never met him. My mother had died by then, but her voice remained. The night he appeared in Grand Park in Chicago, 
My mother said to me, you better be down there. You better go to that inauguration. It had been 232 years since this nation had been its independence, and this had never happened. I didn't know Senator Obama. I bought the airline ticket and I flew to Washington. I wanted to experience that history. It was more unusual than a total eclipse of the sun. I stood on the wall that January day with 1.4 million of my closest friends. I was thinking a lot of my mother that morning and how impossible it was in her life and how I thought it would have been impossible on my own. In less than a minute, after 232 years, Barack Hussein Obama, with a funny name and a black face, was sworn in as President of the United States and leader of the free world. Don't tell me change is not possible. Something changed. You know who elected Barack Hussein Obama? Young people all across this nation who said, I don't see his color. I don't care what color he is. Inspires me. We all need to be colorblind on mental illness, and we need to start now. If we can eliminate ashtrays from the world I come from, where everyone smokes, or I wanted to smoke, if we can elect somebody with a black face as President of the United States for two terms in the White House. From the world I'm from, where racism was tolerated, every day tolerated, and sometimes applauded. If we can do that, we can do this. We can learn the five basic signs of mental illness, and for the first time, talk about them without judgment or shame, and understand that it's a health issue. It affects one in five adults. That's over 45 million. In fact, one in five adolescents in America. I know for a statistical fact that there are young people in this gymnasium today who are suffering. I know that. It's true of any gymnasium in America. And there's no shame for that. Unless we say there should be shame. What are we waiting for? Your generation can lead this. And if you do, you'll save and change lives. That's why I came to your school today. Some, sometimes I travel all around New England, and sometimes I go to schools, they want in there at 8 in the morning. And so I travel at night, sometimes in bad weather. And I've got to be honest with you, on some of those trips, I think, maybe I'm wasting my time. Maybe I'm the only one that cares about this. And then I have an experience, like I had a few months ago, in a middle school in southern New Hampshire. I was speaking to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade kids that were sitting on the gym floor. I must have been the oldest person that was spoken to them in the gym. But they listened. It's amazing, they listened. And when I finished speaking, I was standing by the exit of the principal, and a young boy came over, and shed his right arm, and shake my hand. He told me his name and his age. He was 13. He was in eighth grade. He said, thank you so much for coming to our school today and talking about it. I said, you're welcome. I was happy to be here. He said, I want to tell you why I'm thanking you. I said, sure. He said, they tell me I'm on the spectrum of myself. And your talk here today has changed my whole life. He said, can I give you a hug? And he started hugging me and he was crying. And my eyes watered too. Matter to him. I didn't change his whole life. I know that. But maybe for the first time in his young life, he felt he could share his challenges with someone who he knew would not judge him or blame him. That young man should be able to hug anyone, tell anyone. What are we waiting for? Anyway, thanks for listening. I need your help. Thank you. I want to introduce you, I know you've been here a while, but I want to introduce someone to you who I just greatly admire. He made today possible for me, by the way. His name is T.J. Donovan.
as Attorney General of Vermont. I met him about eight or ten months ago, maybe a year ago now, and I really brought the environment. He gets it. When I was your age, by the way, growing up in Massachusetts, the Attorney General of Massachusetts never came to my high school or any high school that I know of. He was kind of a mystery person, he was a distant person. This guy is Brown Lowell. And it's an honor that he's here and I value his support. And I'd like you to give him your attention for a few minutes. He's worth listening to. My privilege to introduce the Attorney General of Vermont, PJ Nutter. Well, it's great to be here in Manchester at Burn Burton, and I want to first thank you for the invitation. But I'm here because I think, just like all of you, I'm inspired by John Broderick. And I'm not here to talk to you as, as Attorney General. I'm here to talk about what John has inspired me about. You know, I grew up in Burlington. Don't hold that against me. And I grew up in a big family. And we had mental, we had a mental illness in my family. One of my siblings suffers from it. And it's been probably 30 years. I've never talked about it. And I want to acknowledge the people in this room who may be suffering. Or perhaps the people in this room who have a sibling or a parent or a friend who suffers from mental illness and acknowledge the pain of suffering in silence. It's debilitating. It truly is. And I, I also want to be honest and acknowledge that I don't blame my parents, I don't, it's just not what we did. We certainly talked about it internally, but we never talked about it publicly. And in addition to that pain, the emotion that I think I mostly felt was shame. And the best definition of shame that I've ever heard is that it's a disease that erodes one's soul, that it just keeps chipping away. And when we seek for that peace and that understanding, we have to understand when it comes to this issue, I'm always reminded of the line that Yates wrote, that peace comes dropping slowly. And that's exactly what it's been in my family's case. And until I heard John Broderick, never talked about it. But I'm also going to tell you, since I've been talking about it, it's become so much easier to acknowledge it, not to be ashamed, not to be embarrassed. I still love my sibling, I always will, but the pain's real. So I'm trying to do my part, but you guys know this as well as I do. It's not going to be guys like me and John Broderick who get this job done. It's going to be your generation. It's going to be you. You guys are so much better than us. You are not divided by the things that divides my genre, my generation or John's generation. And as an elected official, I have to tell you, we listen to your generation. You're leading on so many issues. We need you on this one. We need you to lead on this issue. That mental illness is a disease, and we need to treat it as such. We need to normalize this, to understand what the five warning signs are. But let it start here, by taking care of each other, by acknowledging people's pain, by standing up for people who need our help, by making sure that nobody gets bullied, nobody gets pushed in the corner, or nobody gets left behind. And let it send up their mind can lead on this issue. Now, when we achieve this goal, which I think we can through hard work, through perseverance, by overcoming, 
I want it to be said that it started in Manchester at Burn Burn Academy by the students in this room who were inspired like me by John Roderick. We need your help. Thanks for joining the cause. Thank you.